Good morning and good evening. We will be starting our Bitmovin webinar in about five minutes. Good morning and good evening. Thanks for joining us. We are going to get this webinar started in about four minutes. Good morning and good evening. We will be starting this webinar in just a few minutes. Good morning and good evening. We're going to start this webinar in just about two minutes. We're going to let a few more people join and then we'll get started. Okay, one more minute and we'll get started. So. 
Okay, I think we've given enough time for the stragglers to join. So we're gonna go ahead and get this presentation started. Today is Wednesday, January 29th, 2020, and welcome to this BitMoven webinar, Video Technology Trends in 2020. So let's set up some context here. Like us, you've probably been overwhelmed with the complexity of the online video industry, as well as all of the recent developments in the past year, both from an industry and business perspective, as well as from the technology perspective. We've been dealing with this for a long time, just like you, and we recognize it can be challenging to make sense of all the noise. So our goal for today is to help you create a roadmap. So in this roadmap, we're not gonna be able to provide all the answers for everyone, but we hope to be able to structure our thoughts in a way that lets us take action and understand what's going on in the industry so that we can improve and evolve your streaming video business. So while we can't answer all your questions, what we will be able to do is at the end have a Q&A session and all the things we're gonna be talking about today have pages and pages of additional documentation and white papers so that any of the topics that you find interesting, you can double click and dive a lot deeper. So we'll have more information about that at the end. Well, probably good time to introduce who's talking and the rest of our panelists. My name is Kieran Farr. I am the VP of Marketing at Bitmovin, and I'm proud to be your host today as we go through the treacherous waters of online video streaming. And I'd like to introduce our two additional panelists. Chris Mueller is the CTO and co-founder of Bitmovin and joining us live from Austria. Thanks for joining, Chris. Hi, guys. Hey. Hi, guys. Looking forward to talk about the themes of 2020 with you. Thanks. And we're also joined by Katy Oberdeek here in my time zone of San Francisco, joining us as our expert product marketer. She has her eyes on the market and is helping our teams position our products and services in the ever-changing seas, the rough and tumble oceans of online video. Hi, Katy. Hi, Karen. Welcome on board, everyone. Thank you. So let's go ahead and look at our agenda. How are we gonna structure this discussion today? So we are in the middle of our introduction. I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail on the methodology and the sources of information that we're using for today's presentation. And then what we've done is that we've assembled three primary themes to help make sense of all of the different events that are going on. And we'll reveal those in just a minute. For each of these three themes, then we're going to all go through what is the evidence and the headlines that validate this theme. We'll then see what does that impact, uh, what does the impact mean for broadcasters and online streaming companies. And then we'll dive deep with Chris into what are the technology requirements and how is that landscape changing that affect that core uh, pain point and value driver. We'll have a quick conclusion where we have clear action plans and next steps to help improve your business. And then we'll have Q&A open to everyone. So let's go ahead and get started. So first I'd like to, to give a quick sense of what were the sources we used. Uh, we did a social media survey. I'll, I'll show you the results in just a moment. Um, that's really just getting started. But the real sources here were our 2019 developer report, uh, our friends at our PR agency platform comms, and then analysis from, uh, from our customers. So first let's take a look at a survey that we ran just this past week. And although it's a small sample size, so I think we had a couple dozen, less than 50 respondents, this illustrates the main point of this presentation today. And the main point here is that when we look at the viewer requirements and expectations for how they're gonna choose a subscription streaming service or any streaming service, really, quality of content is on that list, but it is not number one. And these two things that we see tied for first place, I wanna watch the content whenever and wherever, and pricing is top of mind, I think is a good example of this. Again, I'm not gonna say this is a statistically significant survey, but it really does illustrate the point that content is not the only mechanism that is used in the decision-making process for viewers. So why don't we go ahead and look at the other sources that we used uh, that have a lot deeper statistical significance than a Twitter survey. Every year, the Bitmovin team does a developer survey. Katy, can you tell us a little bit more about what this is? 
Yeah, I'm happy to. So uh, every year, right before the IBC conference in September, we conduct the survey. And in 2019, we actually had 542 participants from over 100 countries. So if you haven't seen this developer report before, it's totally worthy of a deep dive by itself. The report provides uh, very um, insightful insights into the minds of video developers and brings to life the challenges they're dealing with on a daily basis. So as a little uh, snippet here, the biggest challenges, latency and playback on all devices came out on top a second year in a row. And we will touch on those as well as other challenges um, within this presentation. We further worked with our PR agency, Platform Communication, and analyzed over 100 articles in the past year from leading mainstream media to video trade publications. So for this presentation, we selected the most impactful stories and distilled the rest of the information into our overarching themes that Kieran is going to present very soon. Thanks, Kathy. And of course, we talked a lot with our customers. In fact, we ran uh, structured interviews and the goal of these interviews was to actually go quite beyond Bitmovin. And the content of these interviews were much more about what are the pain points that they see in the marketplace, independent of any specific technology, and then distilling this into what are those things that keep them up at night, just a couple of those core things. By the way, if you're watching this and you're a Bitmovin customer and your logo is missing, we would love to add your logo here. <laughs> That's my job on the marketing team. So get in contact with us. Okay, sorry for that aside. So we took those three main sources, the developer report, all of this press information on what's going on in the world, and the direct structured interviews with our customers, and then we fed it into the Bitmovin 5000 supercomputer located in our hometown of Klagenfurt, Austria, powered by schnitzel and schnapps. And uh, more seriously, we found three common themes that ran through all the responses. And we're gonna frame the rest of our conversation today on those three themes that represent the top of mind issues for both viewers and broadcasters. So here they are. Number one, better viewer experience. Number two, faster time to market. And number three, operational optimization. Now I'm gonna go into detail on each one of these, so I'm not gonna do all the definitions right now, but I will share the disclaimer. What I will say is that these are not perfect abstractions. Abstractions are always leaky, but we really tried to come up with abstractions here that represent the market needs and, by the way, are independent of specific technologies. So these are true market drivers where we see that the operators in this space are gonna to need to spend time and attention. Now, of course, this comes back to technology. We're a software company. And so we'll bring each of these points back to what you need to do to make sure that you're staying competitive from a technology perspective. So let's start with the first one, better viewer experience and define what do we actually mean? When we say a better viewer experience, what we're talking about is the end-to-end -end experience that your viewers receive everywhere from the login to the browsing, the navigation and finding the content and of course, to the actual viewing experience itself. We also extend this to the support for high quality video on a wide range of devices. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Katy, who's gonna walk us through what are the trends we've seen in the industry that validate that the quality of the viewer experience is one of the most important issues for modern streaming broadcasters to consider in 2020. Uh, thanks, Karen. Uh, let's start with a couple of examples that illustrate the growing impact of the viewer experience. So what happens when expectations are not met? A lot can go wrong, and the following issues from the past year led to notable press. Unfortunately, not the type of press broadcasters, streaming service, and content providers were looking for. Starting here with HBO's Game of Thrones, where each episode of the last season cost a staggering $15 million. Viewers were actually left in the dark, and they were not able to see the dragons and epic battle scenes. The reasons why? They were very technical and hard to understand for the average viewer. Next, Disney Plus. Their much anticipated launch did not take off as smooth as expected. Disney, Disney not only received a high volume and customer service help calls, their launch issues became the fodder for the late night host and reached an even wider audience. And last but not least, an example from the sports world. This time, Fox Sports and the NFL got hit with a viewer's backlash. The apparently avoidable issue got mapped back to different HDR formats. 
but viewers not only expect great quality, they expect great quality no matter what device they're watching on. And we saw that in our survey as well. And multi-device uh, viewing is the new standard. The typical OTT user accesses, a con accesses their content via three different devices. And that amounts to over 802 million uh, connected devices in the US alone. So looking at this now from the provider side, we learned from the developer report the stunning amount of platforms the developers are actually being tasked to support. The top three platforms across all regions are Apple TV, Android TV, and Chromecast with one regional outlier. Roku made it under the top three in North America and North America only. Great, so I appreciate that background and I also appreciate calling out some of the specifics like the fact that you actually will see regional device usage differences and that example of Roku is a really good example. So not only are we seeing global splintering of platform usage, we actually see this changing on a regional basis which significantly adds complexity. So those are the two top um, trend summaries that we have the increase in devices and platform complexity and we have increased pressure on the quality of the viewer experience. So therefore, if we look at what does that mean for the broadcasters, in order to compete in the modern market, the broadcasters need to master the entire video tech stack with the highest quality solutions. And we really mean this end to end. Even things like your authentication provider or your DRM system become key links in that chain for viewer quality. And of course, we need to come to terms with a multi-device world. Now I'd like to hand it over to Chris, who's going to help us understand what are the technology considerations that are going to be required from broadcasters as we look to 2020 and beyond to make sure we meet this goal of high quality viewer experiences. Thank you, Kieran. Uh, I think you and Kati already said it basically. We live in a multi codec world and uh, we think 2020 will be the year where we move away from the monolithic dominance of H.264 uh, into a multi-codec world. And I think it's, it's just natural. I mean, if you look at the statistics on the right side, for example, we see for sure you can reach like 100% of the devices with H.264, but you are not providing the best quality to our users by just using H.264. There are codecs out there which are much more efficient. Just take VP9 or HEVC. They are 50% more efficient than H.264. Uh, and you can reach a stunning amount of devices with these codecs. So you can actually reduce your costs with these codecs or keep your costs in the same uh, uh, amount and double the quality for your users. I think this is what is required in the market. This is what we see. And actually we think that uh, this will just, this complexity will just continue to grow. So we think with, with new formats coming out, AV1, for example, but also BBC and AV2, we are, which are currently in the making, uh, for 2020 and beyond, this will be the same. In general, we hear people always talking about um, Netflix great quality, but if you want to have Netflix great quality, it also needs Netflix great complexity. Netflix is using all of the codecs. Netflix uh, is using a lot of very complex technologies like per title encoding, for example, to deliver the best possible quality for their users and their viewers. And if you want to do so, you also need to deal with the same complexity. We think it's to some degree unrealistic to support this end-to-end -end internally for most of the broadcasters. So we think they need to partner with somebody who is really an expert in the OTT area so that they can basically focus on what they do well and also focus on the content because you we see it the same way as a small company you only have so many developers you only have so many resources you need to focus on the things that you are doing really well i think this will be a real theme of 2020 and we think in 2020 the complexity of these workflows will just continue to grow uh, but it's needed to deliver a superior quality basically that's the bar that is set by a lot of other services out there and that's the bar that is set by the broadcast and linear signals that we see. And I think the companies that will be able to adapt to these changes very quickly, the companies that uh, uh, manage to deal with the complexity of these workflows will be the winners of 2020 and beyond. Um, another thing, when we are talking about complexity, it's not only on the, on the codex side. We see a lot of 
what we call value, value added features coming out. Um, what we mean with that is basically things like high dynamic range HDR or Dolby Vision, offline playback, 4K and soon HK, uh, 8K, advanced Dolby and DTS audio. And this is just a short list. This list will continue to grow. So you can not think that that's it. And if I implement these four things on there, uh, then I'm good to go. Basically new uh, innovations are coming out on a continuous basis in this market. And only companies that uh, are able to adapt very quickly, companies that have processes which are very agile, uh, will be the companies that will basically uh, uh, be able to survive in that market. And we think companies that are set up in this way, that are agile enough to adapt uh, to these new features quickly, will be the winners of 2020 in terms of your experience. Um, as we heard from Kati already, um, devices are, are growing like crazy. I think everybody who works in the market has experienced that. I just uh, we researched some statistics and they're basically all showing the same. Uh, there's a picture on the, on the right-hand side, which basically shows uh, a device profile growth from 2011 to 2019. Device profile in, uh, means here basically a device paired with an operating system. So it doesn't mean that we have or that these statistics see 63,000 different devices. It sees 63,000 different device profiles, which is a device combination uh, with an operating system. But still, these are devices that you have to test for. These are devices that uh, your consumers are using to access your platforms. These are the devices um, that you basically need to deliver a very superior uh, experience. The statistics are from the top 80,000 uh, uh, websites. And we also see, and everybody sees that more or less, that this continues to grow. It's growing with almost 20% of a year. And in the, in, the, in the future, basically, this will just continue. And look at the market right now. Devices are coming out or coming to market on a six month basis. And only companies that are able to adapt very quickly to that are the companies uh, that will basically be the winners of 2020. Yeah, even worse <laughs> for some uh, uh, to reach like 95% of devices, which is typically a thing what we hear from most of the developers. If you build something, uh, a particular feature, or if you harden your workflow, you typically want to do it in a way that you at least reach 95% of the devices. But in the media market, we have this long tail of devices, uh, pretty nicely shown in the graphic on the right side, actually. So on the Y axis, you basically see the reach that you get. And on the X axis, you see the devices that you need to support. You see that getting to 50% of the devices, you just need to test a couple of devices or control a, tuple, a couple of devices. But if we take, for example, North America, the green dime, you need to test like 350 devices already to just get to 95% of, of device reach. So you see, to get to 50, 60, 70% is not easy, but it's very much possible, so, but to get this last 20, 30% that are really needed to deliver a superior uh, uh, quality, basically, that's the really hard part. That's the last mile uh, that everybody has to go, I think, so in 2020 to deliver a really good experience. Also, if you look at other continents, for example, Africa, then, thank you, <laughs> um, then basically uh, uh, you need to support even more devices. You look there, it's like 650 devices that you need to test for. So that's not that's not an easy part. And uh, I think this problem will continue to grow. We think this tail will actually get longer. So basically it will get harder and harder over time to support all these devices. Companies that don't have the processes in place to support this will not be able to make it in this market. Um, device fragmentation in general will continue to grow as set and it's not a one-off project. Um, the video market is shifting very quickly and it will continue to do so. You can accept it, you can deny it, but we think it is what it is. And in the future, it will just get worse. Devices get out on a six month basis, we heard. The value added features we thought just before are coming to market. This is something where you have to adapt really quickly. In general, we think only companies that are flexible enough to adapt will continue to deliver a superior video experience in 2020 and beyond. Um, a very important thing, what we see currently, I mean, you can only improve if you measure. 
So before you can even start to optimize, you need to measure. And we see a lot of companies that don't do this. We see a lot of companies sometimes doing the simple things, but sometimes not even those on a continuous basis, like testing your workflows or your encodings on a regular basis on VMOF, PSNR, and SSIM, and taking actions based on these uh, metrics, um, considering or, or measuring your buffering, your bitrate quality, and playback failures on a continuous basis, and also taking actions based on these metrics. But we don't see a lot of companies really going into, into detail here and taking advantage of the more advanced metrics and data, for example. So the adaptation behavior of individual sessions, the adaptation behavior in uh, individual regions, individual countries, for example, of individual users, and really tailoring the experience for these users, measuring and improving on a day-by-day -day basis. Also, bitrate usage patterns are something that we not see many companies basically taking a deeper look into and optimizing their encoding profiles for. Same for convex hardware for encodings. I mean, we don't see many uh, companies really taking uh, uh, measurements there on the convex hard side on a continuous basis if they change codex settings, if they change or if they use different codecs, and also adapting based on the viewers uh, that they see in their systems. Um, doing this in real time is something that we think is very important because, I mean, this is something new. This is, I think, the, the, the standard principle of every company that wants to grow, basically. The faster you can run experience, experiments, the faster you can grow, basically, because not every hypothesis that you have, not every experiment will get the expected result. So the faster you can run an experiment, the faster you can actually see that what you think is probably wrong or what you, what you thought is, is right basically and redo the experiment and get it in production or change it. So it's really important how fast you can run these experiments. We think companies will get much better basically on this in 2020 and the best ones will be able to run experiments uh, on a daily basis and to that degree also improve on a daily basis. Great, thank you. And Chris. with that, um, I want to give it back to Karen. Awesome. So let's go through our next theme here, which we're calling faster time to market. And for us, this means a few things at the same time. So first of all, it means bringing entirely new services to market. So launching new OTT services. And then it also means, once those services are launched, making that content available. And we see two very common use cases where content needs to be available very quickly. One is for time sensitive material to have a very quick turnaround from the production uh, conclusion to bringing it available on all the devices that users want. And of course, when adding new libraries, so when content rights are secured, making sure that you are maximizing the monetization of those assets as quickly as possible and that you don't have inventory essentially going stale on the shelf. So Kathy, maybe you can help us understand why we thought that faster time to market was an important thing on our list. Yeah, for sure, Kieran. Um, all of you heard already the, the terms gold rush, streaming wars, but whatever you want to call it, at the end of the day, old as well as new services are rushing to market, markets worldwide and are battling for eyeballs and subscribers. For all the new OTT services, every lost week means a number of subscribers is lost to the competition and the market leaders are pushing forward. So in its recent earning calls, Netflix, for example, announced that it added 8.76 million subscribers worldwide between October and December. And that was actually uh, during the November time when Disney Plus and Apple TV joined the streaming market. So the comp competition is becoming fierce and not even the experts are certain how it is going to play out and what the winning formula is to stay in the top five. So one of the most publicized strategies here is content is king. Um, we just uh, saw a new article where it was announced that even more than 500 scripted series in the United States alone were released in 2019. That's an absolute new high and a 52% increase since 2013. And the streaming services clearly helped driving this growth. And while there are tons of articles about the billions of dollars that are being spent on content creation, it's the heavy lifting of making this content available that gives a huge competitive advantage, the speed to market that Kieran already uh, talked about. And he already talked about the use cases where fast turnaround times of content are uh, crucial. So one is the change of content rights. 
the money that Disney Plus, for example, spent on the Star Wars franchise needs to come back in form of market share as quickly as possible. Uh, another scenario is legacy broadcast content made available to be streamed on demand. So broadcasters like the BBC are looking for faster workflows to bring popular shows like Strictly Come Dance in minutes, not hours, to their iPlayer. So when it comes to speed, we also cannot forget to talk about live events, mainly sports um, and online streaming. Every second, if not millisecond, counts. And as you can see, OTT is lagging behind. That leads traditional networks to believe they have a competitive advantage over streaming services. So I'll let Chris get into the technical details here, but it's clear that Amazon, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and others will notably change in how our favorite sports are going to look and feel. Thanks, Cathy. So let's summarize that quickly. All the new services are rushing to market and battling for eyeballs and subscribers. We've got our gold rush and uh, streaming battles there. Um, viewers expect immediate turnaround time for new content. So therefore, what are the requirements then for broadcasters for 2020 and beyond? The ability to quickly launch new OTT services that support a wide variety of platforms in very tight timelines and that make sure that those OTT services have efficient end-to-end -end workflows for both on-demand and live, with the ability to quickly publish entirely new libraries with the push of the button. So Chris, how can we do that? And how can broadcasters get ready to serve these needs? Uh, yeah, Kieran, that's, that's not an easy one because I said uh, uh, before already, we have so many devices and uh, new devices are coming out on a continuous basis, but uh, I think it's, it, it gets even more competitive. It's really not if you support the device, it's when you support the device. Uh, your competitors in the market, they are probably already on these devices or they are faster on these devices than you are. And I think 2020 will be the scene where we see companies iterating very quickly and getting on these devices uh, in a very fast way. Uh, the media market is very dynamic. New formats, codecs, devices appear quickly and on an even faster basis. And what we think, I mean, I'm citing here a very famous venture capitalist and uh, the founder of, of Netscape. So Mark Andreessen said, software is eating the world in all sectors. And in the future, every company will become a software company. And this is also our hypothesis, basically, because software is just flexible and we think how the market adapt and how we as economy uh, adapt basically we need this flexibility so cloud and software-based workflows we get more traction from our perspective i guess you guys heard that before over the years but honestly uh, i really think now the time uh, is there basically we see it with our customer base we see now much more people taking up the cloud and really utilizing all the benefits that the cloud has Beforehand, we saw a lot of people tapping somehow into the cloud, but not getting all the benefits out because you don't get all the benefits out if you not have a certain footprint in the cloud, if you not um, move a certain amount of workflows into the, uh, into the cloud and utilize a lot of features that are there. I think companies now have experimented with the cloud quite for some time and now found a way to work with it in really good ways. And we think 2020 will be the year where we see more of that. Agility is key for the video market to support new formats and devices quickly. We heard that before. So also here to reduce your time to market, what you need is to be very agile in the processes that we have. When devices come out in a six month basis and you need to be on these devices uh, much quicker than your competitors are to capture market share, you need to be very agile how you are set up. You need to work with the right partners, uh, you need to probably uh, uh, make the right decisions when you consider buy or build. Um, you probably need the right infrastructure underneath. You need to set up that infrastructure in the right way to, very flex to be very flexible. So we think this will be a, a common theme that we see across uh, our companies in 2020. So in 2020, we will see companies getting really good at that and new devices will come out and these companies, uh, the good ones, will adapt very quickly. Um, turnaround time, as already heard from Kati, is important. I mean, the BBC was uh, one use case that got mentioned, for example. Um, this was like for a particular show in the UK, which was uh, uh, Strictly Come Dancing. 
uh, which aired at 8 p.m. and it took then the BBC basically or together with this whole workflow several hours or so four to five hours or even more to get this uh, uh, show onto the OTT channel. But the problem was then it was like 12, 1, 2 a.m. in the morning. So nobody was watching this anymore and actually others got this asset already online somewhere else. So others were capturing basically the viewership, we're capturing the advertising revenue, we're capturing the subscription revenue. And it's also not a great user experience. If you just missed uh, a couple of, uh, uh, or a, a half an hour of the show and you watch it from the beginning and you have to wait until 1 a.m., it's probably not the experience that we want to see. So we think for, for news shows and critical events, they need to be online as soon as possible to monetize the content in the most efficient way. We think companies are really getting better there in 2020, but especially beyond, we will see here much more. Fast encoding in whatever way you will do it offers near instant turnaround time and highest quality. We think we will see much more of those, especially for the critical ones. So basically sports, news, and uh, critical news events in general. Um, to get to that, we think, as before and already mentioned, we think cloud-based workflows uh, are crucial because that's the only way how you can really scale horizontally. That's the only way how you can support the flexibility or the elasticity that you need basically uh, uh, to support these workflows. And on the other hand, also, we always see this bursting uh, and these peaks when it comes to broadcasters or to uh, general news media services. So we think hybrid cloud scenarios, hybrid cloud workflows that allow to burst jobs. Uh, when you're on-premise to a fixed, uh, on a fixed infrastructure to exceed capacity into the cloud, I think this will be a common theme that we think. All of these things adding complexity, like we heard before, so it, unfortunately, I have to tell you, we think it will not get easier. Uh, it will look better for the consumers, so the consumers will get a better experience, but underneath, uh, it will be harder to manage if you don't partner with the right people in the space, I think, so if you don't set up uh, your software stacks or your stacks in a way that you are flexible enough to adapt to these things. So 2020 will be the year, hopefully, of nowhere waiting, and companies will get better in bringing content online in an efficient and very fast way. Yeah, I think also something that everybody who works in the media industry has heard in the uh, in the media in 2019 several times. So latency, latency, latency and especially low latency dominated the OTT media in 2019. We don't saw many real life applications that uh, worked particularly well. And I think that's that's okay. We are just at the beginning. We are in, in its infancy when it comes to low latency. I think 2020 will be the year where we see the first applications really hitting the market. Uh, we think the new formats like the MPEG Dash and HLS low latency formats will be used much more. I don't think that everybody, everything will work well in 2020. We will experience new problems, especially at scale with these formats, but we will learn from these problems. We will incorporate these problems, we will get better. The learnings will help us basically in 2021 and beyond to harden these workflows. I think we will get very close to where we are currently with satellite broadcast, but I think there's even more possible for OTT delivery because we don't have to send the signal uh, to the satellite and back down because it, we can capture it where it is. We can actually distribute it faster than it is uh, on the broadcast channel today. So we don't currently we're in the phase where we try to match what is on broadcast, but I think in the years to come, we will actually exceed uh, user expectations on that end. So in 2020, we will see increased usage uh, of MPEG Dash, I think, and especially HLS low latency, and especially at large scale events. Not everything will go away and will go well, but the learnings will help us. And as an industry, we have to do this to provide a better experience in 2021 and beyond. Great. Thank you, Chris. And with that, I want to hand back to Karen. Awesome. So we're on our third and final value driver for 2020. And we've called this operational optimization. And yes, it is a little bit of a uh, mouthful. Um, but what we really mean here is creating a sustainable business. So scaling modern streaming services while maintaining positive youth and economics. We understand that in the short term, 
uh, a lot of operators are now trying to buy audiences. And so that may not be profitable from a pure P&L perspective. However, it is still crucial at these stages that the unit economics and the per viewer math works out correctly. Because the last thing that we want our customers in the industry doing is building an unsustainable business where it costs too much to actually service the viewers uh, in order to have a successful launch. So there's other things we put under this umbrella, uh, a lot of things under mitigating risk. Um, so content protection for SVOD, meeting viewer demands uh, while maximizing revenue for AVOD. And so I'll get into a little bit more about what that means uh, in a moment. And then the umbrella for all of this is we wanna mitigate the risk of failure. These are really high value assets that we're uh, creating and distributing. And at the end of the day, it is now the streaming workflow uh, that will be taking the majority of viewership. And we need to make sure that those systems are robust and will be able to serve the business needs of these uh, large organizations. So with that, Katy, how's the weather out there? Hi, Kieran. So it's actually looking extra challenging out here when it comes to operational optimization. While everyone focuses on who's going to win the streaming wars, there might be services that will not come out on top. One of the early casualties is actually Sony's PlayStation View, which ends its services tomorrow. The announcement came even though Sony repeatedly raised the price of View to try to offset its rising costs. So operational optimization means keeping costs in check and covering them with the money the business generates while achieving healthy margins. And let's look at the main monetization models and what set of operational challenges, challenges uh, they each come with. Subscription and ad-based models are the leading ones, and uh, that was also confirmed by our developer survey. For uh, subscription-based models, the dominant players, Netflix, Amazon, Prime, Disney+, Plus, are already pushing people's spending limits. The average American video streaming subscriber today uses and pays for 3.4 services. That's around $29 per month. And that is less than a third of the average monthly cable bill, which is around $107. There are plenty of service, uh, of service right now uh, going around that try to feel out what the consumers are willing to spend. And one of the latest ones we've seen was uh, they're willing to spend up to another $11, that's 50% more, but again, still way under um, a monthly cable bill. And so while the subscription-based services are still pre preferred by consumers, one of the competitive um, advantages here is or one of the deciding factors is actually the content so this kind of content it's premium they need to they need to protect us protect it and the more surprised we were when we learned from our developer survey that only 40 percent of the participants are even protecting their content and using drm and with more services entering the market each with a unique content library piracy will be on the rise again Fans often don't want to watch uh, want to watch a streaming service all of the content they have. They are picking and they would like to pick and choose and just want to watch certain shows. Another issue which we, which we feel needs to be mentioned here because it costs us, it costs streaming services millions of dollars is password sharing. A coalition that includes Netflix and HBO is stepping up uh, their efforts to crack down on password sharing. But the new measures have been but no new measure measures have been implemented yet. So if you don't want to pay more for streaming services um, than the services you already have, and you're keeping it legal, then you hopefully enjoy watching ads before getting to your content. I'm coming from the ad tech world, and I know firsthand that ads are being disliked for various reasons. The data about the usage of ad blockers that you see here just underlines how viewers around the world are trying to get around ads. So personal preferences aside, if the technical issues behind the viewer complaints can be resolved and a smooth and better experience for the viewer can be achieved, um, the AVOD model will see further adoption in the future. Thanks, Katy. Sounds like some stormy weather indeed. Back here in the studio, let's summarize what those trends are. So unit economics need to work at least someday. So we need to make sure that on a per viewer basis, uh, it's a reasonable economic model and that our cost structure uh, supports this. Um, and we need to make money and we need to do so without upsetting our viewers. 
Therefore, if we look at those requirements, we need to reduce the delivery costs while still increasing quality, which seems like almost an impossible task, and Chris will let us know if we can do that. Um, we need effective but not obtrusive content protection. We need to have smooth advertising experiences that still generate moolah, and we always need to make sure we're preventing disaster. So this sounds like a lot. Is this even possible to do, Chris? Yeah, it's not, it's not easy, I would say. And we know this by heart, I have to say. Um, we see now uh, a lot of companies, and we went through the same phases, more or less, are uh, really in the scaling phase. And usually in the scaling phase, you somehow scale at any cost, and you don't uh, uh, take efficiency so much into account. You know you have a certain business model, you know your unique economics will work uh, uh, at a certain stage, and you're just scaling, you're just trying to get market share. That's a good thing. And I think the problems that currently a lot of companies are facing are also good problems. So for example, of course, for delivery are exploding. Um, that's a nice problem to have because it means somebody is actually using your service or a lot of people are using your service. And I think we see a lot of companies currently getting into this efficiency phase. So quality is an important factor, but without operational op optimization, it's not possible to deliver a superior experience as budgets are not endless. What do we mean with that is basically that even if these companies are scaling at, at any cost right now, still they have restricted budgets. And now they are getting into the phase where they say, how do I spend this budget more wisely, basically? We have customers that, for example, by just using per title encoding and three pass encoding, saved 80% on the storage side and 80% on the CDN distribution side. But this doesn't mean that they saved all of those, basically all of those dollars. They basically reinvested a lot of these dollars to acquire more customers, to get to new markets, for example. So basically their storage costs somehow stayed the same and their CDN costs also stayed the same, but they can actually now reach like uh, more than double the customers that they reached before with the same budget. So that's, uh, that's the phase where I think uh, we are currently in or where a lot of companies are currently getting to and the said it's a nice it's a nice problem to have and we know it also by heart uh, as a company as bitmovie we also went through these phases and i think that's just normal if you are successful we think that uh in 2020 we will see much more of these advanced technologies also some of these things what, what netflix basically is doing because of their sheer scale like the title encoding for example or multi codex or using multi codex all these things that make it hard on an operational side, but also the things that make you more efficient and help you also on the quality of experience side. I think we will see more three pass encoding, for example, to improve the individual bit rates. We will see, as Kati already mentioned, the ad experiences are not really good. We are not even on bar with what we see currently on the linear or broadcast channel. So I think we see more SSEI, for example, so server side ad insertion in 2020. We will see more things on the player side uh, when it comes to operational efficiency really adaptation logics that are tailored for certain regions but also tailored probably for the individual users and adapted on a continuous basis to deliver the experience which is uh, uh, best for the user so we still see companies and that's good because they are successful so delivering for example 4k video the same adaptation logic to a mobile device with a 10 inch screen where you can probably not see even the difference between a 720 bit rate and the 1080 bit rate. So it's somehow wasting uh, bandwidth and also uh, uh, bandwidth in general yeah, and also computational power on these devices. And we think 2020 will be the year where we will, companies will get much better. Also, for example, on the CMOF side, so we think that CMOF segments for HLN, HLS and Dash will get more popular. So you don't probably have to store now two separate sets, uh, one for HLS and one for Dash, which basically doubles your storage. We think companies will tap into the direction of just storing a single uh, uh, set and referencing it with HLS and Dash. And this will us overall make us more efficient. So I think that would be a good start for 2020. Another thing what we have in mind, but not for I think 2020 will be the start, but uh, it's more for the years beyond. What we see is like uh, something like a common video infrastructure layer starts to develop. Um, currently, there's a lot of fragmentation and do-it-yourself in the media market. 
that reminds me a little bit of the network market of the 80s. For example, in the 80s, um, everybody was more or less building his own router, his own switches, his own networks. If you now talk with companies, Fortune 500 companies, basically nobody is doing that except probably the really, really big ones like Amazon and Google that have their own data centers, but even those in the offices are buying this hardware from one of the top vendors of the network market that could be a Cisco, it could be Netgear and others that are dominating that market. That was a natural revolution, basically an evolution that was going on in the 80s because this was the only way how the market could make the next step. I mean, you only have so many resources as an economy that you need to spend wisely. So this was just the next step to get more efficient. We think currently that's the beginning in the media market. We see uh, uh, what, for example, TCP IP was uh, for the media or for the network market will be API based services for the, for the video markets. Companies uh, uh, will probably focus more on their core competences, which will make them more efficient and effective in the end. So they will basically buy building blocks uh, from one of the top vendors of this infrastructure, video infrastructure layer, and they build their value added services on top and really focus on what they do well, like they currently do also with networks, for example. We'll be a start out of this common, how we say, video infrastructure layer with building blocks that many companies provide. These building blocks from our perspective will have interfaces to work with each other. So like with in the network market, for example, you could buy a router from Cisco, but you could connect it with a switch from Netgear, for example. You see the same thing will happen or starts to happen currently in the media market. And I think 2020 is the beginning of this. We'll see more API-based services, not because we also have API-based services. And currently, I just think that's the future. This is how Amazon operates now since decades, for example, services-based architectures, how other companies operate very successfully since a long time. I think these API-based services, as I said, uh, this will be the TCP IP, basically, of the video infrastructure market. We don't have the defined interfaces yet, but I think this will come. It will start in 2020, and then the years out, this will get, uh, uh, we will see this more and more. Same on the player side, for example, currently, basically each of the uh, uh, of the devices has a different API and it's very hard to deploy on those. Uh, the time to market increases obviously here too, uh, but also from an operational efficiency standpoint, that's, uh, that's really hard. We see that uh, there will be unified player APIs provided by several companies, probably also building blocks that interact with each other that help these companies to provide an infrastructure layer for all of these devices where they can build up on all. And that will eventually and hopefully make us as an industry more effective. 2020 will be the year where we see the beginnings of a common infrastructure layer for video that will ultimately make the whole industry more efficient. Kati talked to this a little bit advertising. I think we are not there yet. I think 2020 is more or less the start, uh, next evolution of advertising. Video advertising on OTT from our perspective is still in its infancy and we are just scratching the surface in terms of possibilities to serve ads in a better and richer way. What we mean with that is basically currently we try to match the experience more or less that you have on the broadcast channel and sometimes we're not even able to do this. So currently yeah, if you see this, you as a user of the internet, you probably also see this on several services. You see ad failures. Sometimes the ad is not starting or the ad is starting and afterwards the video is not working, which is even worse. You see sometimes long startup delays. So you, you wait a very long time, probably in between a video for a mid-roll ad uh, to start and afterwards to go back to the video, which is just not a good experience. We see sometimes badly designed ad experiences that have been designed for the linear channel and just ported to the OTT channel. We think there's so much more possible. So actually thinking beyond this, currently we're trying to match what, what linear broadcast TV delivers, but actually with all the data that we have, with all, all the programmatic elements that we have, and with programmatic, I don't only mean programmatic ads, I mean, all what we have is software, basically it's adaptable. Uh, uh, we can really adapt a whole website, the whole experience uh, for the user. We can define a whole new ad experience. And I think this is something what we will see starting in 2020 and in the years beyond. So really 
taking into account more or less the current mood of the consumer or the customer of your platforms because we know exactly on which shows he watched beforehand on what which buttons he clicked when he stopped when he fall asleep um everything basically and we can really tailor the, the experience in a really great way and deliver something that is different than the ad experience that they currently have on on linear broadcast um in general i think 2020 is said we're still pretty year we try to match uh what we currently have on broadcast so we see more and more server side at the search uh to just get a better user experience but ultimately at the end i think and beyond we will see advertising really change in 2020 and beyond and we will see better ad experiences and better designed ads for ott um, um one of the most important things i think i measure uh, i mentioned that now uh, quite a few times already but especially here when it comes to operational efficiency i think it's it's crucial the, there's no way how you can improve when you're not measuring. And we know this also uh, as a company, if you don't have the metrics in place, if you don't have the analytics in place, you actually know somehow something is not going right, but you know exactly what to change. And even worse, if you change something and you don't even know what impact it has and why it had that impact, for example, so it's really hard to run experiments on a quickly basis. So before we can even start to work on efficiency, we need to identify the inefficient parts. So we see a lot of companies currently using an analytic solution, but not many can really make effective use of the data. So really produce actionable insights out of the data that we have. Usually we also see uh, that just parts of the workflow are tracked and also the metrics that are used are not correlated across systems. So typically we see analytic solution in place on the client side somehow, but not really correlated with the CDN or merged together with the CDN data or the encoding data. And you always have this partial view of the system and you really cannot take um, insight or really insights out of it. Or in worse, sometimes companies have all that data, but they don't take, take action of this data or they don't have any means to take action of this data or cannot really analyze this data. So we think actually, 2020, we will see more metrics that are in use, uh, metrics that make more sense for these companies because they had now more time to experiment basically. And um, typically systems uh, uh, we currently don't work in real time and we will see more systems in real time uh, from our perspective. This is really crucial because the faster you can run an experiment, the faster you can basically get uh, uh, to result, good or bad, and improve from this result. So in general, we think in 2020, we will see more companies starting to make use of this data and integrating it into their day-to-day -day workflows to improve on a continuous basis. Awesome. Back to you, Kieran. Thanks, Chris. So we've now gone through our journey. We've seen the three big drivers of value that we think are gonna be important in 2020 and beyond for online broadcasters. So now you may be asking, okay, great, now what? I'm gonna close out this webinar and I got stuff to do. I have a busy busy day, I have a full inbox. But we have a few suggestions on how you can actually use this information to take it to the next level and make a positive change within your organization. So first of all, we ask you to just simply reflect, of these three items here, how do these rank for your company? Are there one or two of them that stand out and are really focus points for you and the rest of the organization? How much pain are you seeing in these different areas? How much is this affecting your ability to be an effective organization? So that's kind of the first step, understanding where we've come from and understanding the map. The next step is diving a little bit deeper. And so after this webinar, we're going to be sending you a follow-up email that has deep dive resources for not just each of these three drivers, but even within there, all the different technology implications that Chris talked about. So these are white papers, the developer report, and more. So that's really the next step after that, get smart. The third thing then is to create a plan of action. And this is where we can help. So our solutions engineers uh, and our business teams at Bitmovin are happy to help you create that map, create that plan. So that would be the next step after that. 
And finally, once you have that plan in place and you understand what we need to do, this is the time to take action. And so if you're ready to start implementing, uh, that's the time to actually start putting pen to paper or code to your IDE and, and making those changes uh, to your actual code base. So after this webinar, we're gonna send you a quick survey with just each of these four questions to see where you are uh, in this process. And we're happy to help you out no matter where you are. Even if you're in the first or second, we can also guide you toward the resources and information that might be helpful to go on your way. So I'd like to close out by thanking our guests and expert panelists. Uh, thank you very much, Chris, for joining in the evening, your time. Um, and thanks you for putting all this together. Um, and then Kathy, thank you for joining early on our uh, morning time here in San Francisco. Um, and I'd like to open it up to a few questions. Uh, we can uh, simply uh, respond to your questions on the GoToWebinar control panel on the right of your screen, you can pop that out. And we welcome both technical questions and uh, more general business questions as well for our panelists. Uh, and before I ask the first question, Chris or Katy, are there any final words that you wanted to share uh, about our webinar today? I think from my perspective, our uh, really interesting webinar, um, really cool and yeah looking forward to the questions actually cool so the first one we have here is talking about the linear ad experience and how people see that translating to online and so um maybe Kathy first if, if you could just give us a sense of what would an ideal experience be um and you know where do we think that we're falling short right now um, I think it depends a little bit from which perspective you are coming. So definitely the marketers are ready and they're looking for inventory and want to be around uh, the video streaming content. And as you know, for them, it's a little bit difficult because most of the uh, premium services are still just subscription based. So there's already from the marketer perspective, a little bit of an inventory issue. And uh, also like from the technical perspective, which Chris can probably much better address, uh, how ads are being inserted into the whole viewer experience. And, um, but again, like from the marketer and then from the, from the consumer perspective, um, what's really important, again, technical aspects aside, more looking from a business perspective here, if you, you cannot just um, take your linear ads like that are running like your Super Bowl ads and transfer it one-on-one, -on -one, for example, to the online experience. Often the content pieces are shorter, so you have to um, basically create like own content. And I think the viewers will yeah. value that if you put some effort into that. Yeah, and that reminds um, so me. So that would be my uh, quick advice. Yeah, even simple things like having a kind of a pre-bumper that says, here's what we're gonna see, and then the ad <laughs> that's an appropriate size, instead of just slapping on a 30 second pre-roll without any you know, relation to the content. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, the next question is about low latency. And um, let's see, John is saying low latency is so new. What is the, you know, what's the shortcut to get started quickly without us having to do all the DIY or the research? Um, so Chris, maybe you can help uh, with that question. That's a, a very good question, I have to say. Um, Unfortunately, I think it's it's not so easy because uh, to get low latency to work, basically all parts have to play together. So uh, low latency is not like more than one end that you need to optimize. It's basically from encoding to storage, to delivery, to player. Each part of the chain basically needs to be optimized to really have a, a, low, lead, a low latency streaming solution. So basically, uh, best uh, also probably to get in touch with us uh, uh, we have uh, uh, test pads with other vendors for example also Akamai on the streaming side for example uh, uh, where we can show low latency streams uh, or how you can set up something like that and uh, best is basically to just tap into it I mean the sooner you you test it all these different formats the sooner you you have some learnings I think we talked about that in the webinar a little bit it's uh, especially for these new things it's, it's about experiments and how fast you can run these experiments because uh, every workflow in this industry unfortunately is a little bit different 
as some of you guys already have probably experienced. So it's very important that you get into the testing, into the experiment phase very quickly. Thank you. Okay. Well, now that we're at time, I want to respect our hour long goal. And um, I appreciate both of you, Chris and Kathy, for uh, joining us for this webinar. Um, and I appreciate all of our audience members for um, spending the time with us today. And like I mentioned, we'll send you a follow up, which will include this basic question on, you know, where are you in this process and how can we help you um, get to the next level in your organization? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.